Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Pei Chen. I go by Peggy as well. Um, I'm a senior research scientist and IP liaison at Kessler Foundation. I'm also affiliated with Rutgers University in New Jersey in medical school. I'm a research associate professor there. Today, I'm the, the title of my talk is Spatial Neglect, How to Assess and Treat It. Or, you know, a more plain uh, language way to talk about uh, what I'm going to talk about is this disorder with many names and many symptoms, and how can we treat it? First of all, I want to show you where I am relatively to you. Uh, I'm in the United States. I'm in New Jersey. Kessler Foundation uh, is a standalone non-for-profit research organization. We have many research centers, and I belong in Center for Stroke Rehabilitation Research. My office is very close to New York. Here's my disclosure. I'm funded through different funding agencies, and I do not receive any financial bonus to sales related to KFNAP and KFPAT, which are two products you will hear about during for the next two hours. So here's the agenda of today's uh, lecture. The first part is about um, spatial neglect. Why spatial neglect? Why it is so important in stroke rehabilitation, or I would argue it's very important for brain injury rehabilitation. And what's its clinical impacts? And how can I help you to know more about detecting and assessing spatial neglect? The second part will be focused on treatment. You know, what's the current knowledge about treating spatial neglect? And I will spend much time on prism adaptation treatment because I have um, studied this particular treatment for about 13 years now. And lastly, I will uh, stay um, for 15 to 20 minutes for the Q&A se session. All right, spatial neglect. You may not familiar with this term. You may familiar with other terms like unilateral hemispatial neglect, like spatial inattention, like visual um, neglect or hemi neglect. And these different names actually create problems. The problems came with many names. It create inconsistency in communication within the science community and between clini clinical disciplines. Like for example, when I talk about spatial neglect, the clinician may talk about spatial inattention and the occupational therapist may talk about hemi neglect, psychologists may use another term. And this inconsistency in communication is very confusing for patients because they don't have the knowledge. And if you put two names on the same disorder, they may think they have two different disorders. And all these impede efficiency in clinical care, limiting the care continuum. When patients move from acute care, for example, to subacute care, to home services, if clinicians are using different terms describing the same disorder, it's very confusing and creates um, difficulty in care continuum and slowing the progress in both research and clinical care. So before I go into what spatial neglect is, how to assess and treat it, I want to tell you uh, something that we recently did uh, for the past two years. A group of us, we conducted a so-called Delphi consensus study. It's a, it's a method to create or to come to consensus on certain things. It has been this method, Delphi consensus method has been used to create uh, medical guidelines, for example. And during this study, we focus on four different big topics related to so-called neglect. The name, the branding problem that I talk about, definition, screening, and assessment. And just for today's purposes, I'm going to talk about name only. So what we did is we invited 138 so-called experts in the field to participate. And in the context of this project, experts were defined as clinicians or researchers with more than five peer-reviewed articles on the disorder, well, however you want to call it at that time. And after the invitation, 66 of them uh, responded and participated. And 63 of them identified themselves as researcher and more than 80% of them have more than 11 years of experience. And 30 identified as 
uh, a clinician. And importantly is that 90% of them have more than 11 years of clinical experience. And they're represented uh, different countries, as you can see here, I'm not going to say all the names of the country, and also represented by different professional backgrounds from physician, um, from cognitive neuroscientist to, to neuropsychologist, um, and psychologist, et cetera. So like I said, uh, I'm going to focus on the name because we would like to develop a globally accept acceptable terminology of the disorder that will be useful for all stakeholders, including researchers, healthcare providers, individuals who are living with the deficits related to the disorder. And now uh, the consensus process has ended and there are two winners. So we can either use spatial neglect or unilateral spatial neglect. So for the entire talk of the day, I'm going to use this term spatial neglect. Regaining functional independence after acquired brain injury, such as stroke or traumatic brain injury, can take years. As many of you know, many of you are clinicians. And one factor that's prolonging this recovery significantly is spatial neglect. Spatial neglect has been documented for more than 100 years, but only received attention from rehabilitation care practitioners very, very recently. For example, a very common um, treatment called the visual scanning training was only published in 1977 in New York. And the prism adaptation treatment was published in 1998 from France. These are, you can say, oh, these are 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. But, and people should use it, but actually not because there's a lack of standardized clinical fe uh, feasible methods to translate published research from a peer reviewed article to the actual method. So my team has uh, worked very hard. And for the last decade, we focus on prism adaptation treatment. So we're the group who first provided standardized prism adaptation treatment protocol. And the latest version is in 2020. So what I want to emphasize is spatial neglect has been neglected by clinicians and for different reasons. So before I delve into what spatial neglect is, what it, um, what's the, you know, the textbook tech, uh, de definitions, I want to give you a more overview from the symptom presentation. It is a syndrome, it's a collection of many different kinds of symptoms caused by damaged neural networks, critical to spatial attention and related cognitive and motor functions. I'm going to give you uh, examples of, of patients who have left-sided neglect. All these patients, they have right brain damage. So the side of space getting neglected is always opposite to the primary side of the brain damage. So in this example, it is called uh, star cancellation. So basically you can print out, you can print out a different stimuli on a piece of paper or present it on a computer screen and ask the patient to mark the target. In this scenario, the target is small stars among with other different stimuli like big starts or letters or words. As you can see, this individual is neglecting the left side of the page and focusing on the right side of the page. This is a clock drawing of a patient who have right brain damage as well. So for the past, uh, for this many years, I work with patients who have spatial neglect, about almost 99% of them can draw the circle themselves so they can draw, they can define the workspace by themselves. But once they start putting numbers in, they're often neglecting the left side and put all the numbers on the right side, even the hands on the right side. You do not have to give patients tests. You can just observe them and you may be able to see symptoms of spatial neglect. These two are great examples that you can probably see currently in your clinical practice. This is someone who have right brain stroke and her, his eyes are pointing toward the right side. The hypothesis, this individual have difficulty to initiate movement toward the left side, toward the neglected side of space. 
So when this person is talking to you, his eye is pointing toward the left instead of looking right at you at the center. We call this gaze preference problem. This is an even more severe case. Her eyes not just looking toward the, the right side, but her entire body is leaning toward the right side because her subjective body center has been shifted from the center to the right side. So she's she like from her perspective, the center is um, more on the right instead of you know centered. And so you can observe patients this way. Or in this picture, I took this picture because I saw this, uh, what we called hanging glasses syndrome. It's not an official name, but you can often see it on patients who wear glasses. I do not wear glasses today. I wear contact lenses, but I do wear glasses um, uh, in the morning. And I believe many of you also have experience wearing glasses. You do not need vision to put your glasses on because you know where your ears are. You know how large uh, the glasses frames are re relative to your face. So patients who have spatial neglect, they often neglect not just space outside their body, but also space on their body. So in this case, this person is neglecting the left ear. So when he put on the glasses, the leg of the glasses is hanging, it's not touching his left ear. And also in that same morning, I noticed he only shave on the right side. So he neglecting the left side when he's shaving. And this is quite uh, often uh, you can observe on male patients. On female patients, if um, they put makeup on in the morning, even when they're hospitalized, you can see that they put makeup on the right side instead of left side. It's just very mild or just none at all. Another example that I want to show you that you can just observe rather than give a test to patient is this video. Let me just make sure I can play it. Where is my person? Here we go. All right. Uh -huh. All right, All right, you finish, Rita. Thank you. You need a spoon? Do you see it? It's on your tray. Look around your tray there. Okay, so in this scenario, the patient is having breakfast. So breakfast time is very, very busy and chaotic, at least in the setting that I work. Um, um, because patients are getting ready, they need to do their morning therapy soon. So in this case, we ask the therapist just to slow down, just watch them and let us film the patient. As you just saw, the patient never ever initiate left or movement. She's focusing on the right side of the tray and failed to find the spoon that she need to eat the oatmeal, right? So what I want to emphasize is for all this observation, you cannot pinpoint whether it is a sensory problem, whether it is a perceptual problem, whether it is a motor problem. In general, it is very hard to do that for spatial neglect because it is a problem of spatial attention. Spatial attention is fundamental to cognitive, to motor functions. And in the rehab setting, I would say motor uh, symptoms of, spa of spatial neglect is very critical to their um, recovery process. So again, I want to reinstate this example is a, is, a, is a way to showcase the motor symptoms of neglect, have initiation problem toward uh, initiate movement toward the left side. This is also, you can also say this is a motor symptom of spatial neglect is because a lot of patients who have difficulty to uh, initiate eye movement 
is also a movement uh, motor component, eye movement ocular motor problem toward the neglected side. So that just put a perspective back to the brain because all these in individuals, either they have stroke or they have brain damage because of traumatic brain in damage or non-traumatic brain injury. It's all go going back to the brain. Here is the cartoon of the brain, the left side of the brain, the right side of the, the, the brain. This is the back of the brain, the, ver the visual cortex, parietal, frontal cortex, etc. So here is I want to show you a very simplified um, uh, schema of so-called attention network. Attention network involves both sides of brain, both hemispheres. Information comes in um, from the back of the brain and goes and process toward the parietal frontal cortexes. And in this, in this uh, figure, there's a sign here. This indicates that the two hemispheres are inhibiting each other all the time. So come to this very uh, dynamic balance for our attention um, balance, basically. Why it is important? Because the right hemisphere is dominating paying attention to the left side. The left hemisphere is dominating of attention control of the right side. So only in this very dynamic balanced way, we pay attention to the center or we can sit up straight, we can walk straight. When we see something, we see the whole picture and we know where the center is. In this example, the right hemisphere is damaged. That means the balance between the two hemispheres is broken. In this case, the left hemisphere is stronger, inhibiting the right hemisphere, the damaged hemisphere. So in this patient, let's say there's a patient whose brain damage look like this, the left, hem the left hemisphere is stronger. So this person will pay a lot of attention toward the right side. Therefore, this person is neglecting the left. So in this scenario, for patients who have, conversely, if a patient have damage in the left hemisphere, let's say the image is you know, uh, switched to the other side, then this person will develop spatial neglect in the right space and pay much attention to the left. So it's always the opposite side. This is a um, theory that's uh, proposed more than 10 years ago and more and more recently, there are more studies coming out talking about not just the cortical structures are important for spatial attention networks, the white matter fiber bundles that connecting different part of the brain remotely from the back of the brain to the front of the brain are also very important because this is a network and meets the so-called highway in the brain to connect information from different locations. So in this study, for example, the researchers found that if patients have brain damage or uh, structure damage among these three major fibers, then the patient will develop persistent, prolonged um, neglect and have, may have more severe symptoms. Lastly, this is from my own work. This, in this uh, scenario, I want to showcase, well, I want to demonstrate one thing. Um, there are 12 patients here. So this is so-called lesion mapping technique. This is not an MRI image. This is a drawn, like hand drawing or a computer drawing of lesions on templates of um, brain images. We do this because different patients, different people have different brain size, different um, landmark in the brain. So it is, very, it is very difficult to compare one brain to another brain. In order to make that comparison possible, we develop, we as a, a science community develop this technique called lesion mapping. We map lesions based on the actual scan on standardized brain so that we can compare different patients across. All these 12 patients, the 12 rows of brain images, all these 12 patients have spatial neglect. But as you can see, just by quickly eyeballing it, their lesion profiles are dramatically different. It could be subcortical only. It could be cortical. It could be more anterior part of the brain. It could be more posterior part of the brain. It could be huge. It could be small. So when you show me a CT scan, when you show me an MRI scan, I cannot tell you whether the patient has spatial neglect or not. 
because this is a network problem. The size of the lesion, the location of the lesion, yes, it matters, but it does not help me to predict whether patients have good prognosis or the, the presence of spatial neglect. If you want to learn more about this topic, here are some suggested reading for you to know more about the neural mechanisms of spatial neglect. So now I'm going to move on to subtypes or different names you may hear about why spatial neglect has been talked about in so many, so many different ways. Because when we um, categorize different symptoms of spatial neglect, we sometimes talk about the spatial region, whether it is close to the body or away from the body. Personal neglect is neglect symptoms presented in the so-called personal space on the surface of the body, such as you know, doing the facial care activities. Peripersonal neglect is neglect symptoms presented within arm's reach, like for example, on the tabletop, like locating utensils on a food tray or doing paper pencil test. Extra personal neglects are symptoms presented beyond arm's reach. For example, locating stimuli at a distance when people are walking down the hallway or even um, on the street. And you may also hear names related to the frame of reference. Clinically, the highly emphasized neglect is egocentric neglect, viewer-centered neglect, body-centered neglect means that when we say people, um, patients who are neglecting the left side, we're talking about they're neglecting the left side of their, of their body. However, a lot of patients also have allocentric neglect, meaning the left of a stimulus, a left of an object. Here is an example of a patient who show both types of neglect. As you can see, the patient, so this is a figure copying task. On a piece of paper, this is the model, two plants, house, two trees. We ask the patient to copy this using a pen and just copy down immediately down on the same page. As you can see, this patient is copying more drawings on the right side, neglecting the left side. So the patient have so-called egocentric neglect and also have allocentric neglect because in each individual stimuli, the patient is neglecting the left side of the tree, of the house, of the plant. About 40% of patients show both. Okay, so I quick click this. Related to the function domain, that's why you may heard different names. So spatial neglect, because it's a disorder of spatial attention, it affects all kinds of systems. So most observable symptoms of neglect are through the visual domain. So that's why a lot of things that we see are visual symptoms. So, so neglect often are called visual neglect. But also shows in auditory domain tactile domain, representational domain, and motor domain. So all these are under the same umbrella of spatial neglect. Just to reinstate and summarize, spatial neglect is a disorder of spatial attention. Spatial attention is very important for all kinds of systems and modalities. So it affects spatial perception. It affects spatial representation. What does that mean, spatial representation? It's spatial memory, mental imagery. So when they, when patients close their eyes and then think about their living room, think about their bedroom, think about the city square they often go in their, in their childhood, they only so-called see in their mind's eye the, the um, good side or right side of things and neglecting the left side or neglected side if the patient have right brain stroke or brain damage. And it also affects motor control. It affects directional movement. They initiate less movement or smaller movement or incomplete movement toward the neglected side and highly affect their mobility and affect their safety. So all the spatial neglect symptoms are mostly lateralized, left versus right. So the hallmark symptom presentations from the textbook or from many uh, research papers that you may have read about is, I'm going just to read this, failure to respond to stimuli presented in the controlational side of space, failure to initiate or complete movement in or toward the controlational side of space, failure to report, manipulate, or produce information stored in the controlational mental space, 
failure to keep their own eyes or body from deviating toward the ipsilisional side. So their eyes are looking to one side or their body leaning to one side. Okay. And there are also symptoms that have their own names. They're, they're not really subtypes, but they are very interesting for researchers and we coin new names. For example, neglect dyslexia. It's a reading difficulty due to spatial neglect. Here is an example of neglect dys dyslexia presentation. In this test, I print out this entire uh, paragraph on a piece of paper and I hand it to the patient. And I have the same paragraph on my, on my own. And I asked the patient to read out loud the words that he, you know, just read this paragraph. On my end, I underline words um, the patient is reading. As you can see, this patient is neglect only read words on this side, neglecting the left side. And this is a classic example of neglect dyslexia. Another symptom is called perseveration. Most of the symptoms that we just talked about are so-called negative, like people didn't do something, they omit something. Perseveration is so-called positive symptoms, people doing too much on the so-called good side. So this is an example of perseveration. This is the same star cancellation task I showed you earlier. It's a different patient's presentation. So the patient is, again, is neglecting the left side and pay too much attention on the right side and cross out or mark the target on the right side only. However, for each target, this person marking the target more than once, multiple times. This is a repeated behavior because of the inability to disengage attention from the good side. It's a mass, uh, manifestation of spatial neglect. Another example is called extinction. I'm going to talk a little bit more about when I talk about assessment tool. Extinction is attentional bias. So when, there's, when there are more stimuli coming toward the patient um, from both sides, from the, from the right and left side, and patient will prefer the information coming from the ipsilisional or good side. There are also non-lateralized symptoms and related deficits about spatial neglect. Non-lateralized symptoms is impairment in sustained attention. As I mentioned, spatial neglect is caused by damage in attention neural network. Attention neural network is not uh, governing many different kinds of attention functions, not just for spatial processing um, functions, also govern sustained attention. So these people, these uh, patients, they have difficulty to stay in the moment. They are easily distracted. There are other so-called spatial uh, symptoms, but it's not uh, lateralized, and I put this picture to um, illustrate it. You can think of spatial attention as a spotlight, and you move the spotlight around in space, right, in different, to different areas. Patients who have spatial neglect, they have difficulty to move their spatial uh, spotlight toward the neglected side, toward the left side. Also, their, um, the spotlight of their spatial attention is smaller, it's narrowed narrowed aperture. You can think of this is smaller in patients who have spatial neglect. Related deficit, this is related to the, the previous talk about uh, self-awareness. Almost all patients I know, they have anosognosia for spatial neglect. Anosognosia means unawareness or insufficient awareness of one's own deficit. Anosognosia for spatial ne neglect is unawareness related to spatial neglect. It is a metacognitive deficit. They may acknowledge it. They may tell you, I have spatial neglect. They say that because the doctors, their families, their therapists will tell them you have spatial neglect. So you need to go to this, you know, go, go through this treatment. But that doesn't mean they recognize the significance of it. Because if they recognize it, they will correct themselves, but they don't. They have difficulty to self-monitor, self-correct their own errors when they're doing a task. This is a big problem because it's a barrier for them to seek help or learning compensatory strategies. You cannot learn compensatory strategy if you don't believe you have the disorder, like you will not change your behavior, right? So this is a big problem uh, when treating patients who have spatial neglect. All right, so we touch on um, a lot of symptoms presentation. Now I'm going to move on to clinical impact. 
How many patients who have spiritual neglect out there? We don't know, actually, um, but we can um, study about it and have some projection. So about two years ago, my student and I, we did a systematic review study. We, so at the end of the uh, literature review, we include 41 studies. And here's the results. So the ends here are number of studies included in different stages post stroke. So acute means about within five, three to five days or to a, or a week. Subacute, it's about three weeks to three months. Post-acute is after that, chronic is after uh, six months or after a year. And here is the prevalence plotted in percentages. All right, here's the results. So here is, this is the main result, the black line. Overall, no matter the patient have right brain damage or left brain damage, overall at acute and a subacute stage, 30% of stroke patients have spatial neglect. And it will go down to about 20%, 18, 16% after. And as you can see, patients who have right brain damage, right side of uh, stroke, their prevalence is much higher above 40% at the early, early stage and down to about 30 to 20%. And I want to emphasize that patients who have left brain damage in the left hemisphere, they also can develop spatial neglect. They're neglecting the right side of space. And it's quite prevalent, quite common, about 20% to 10%. This is not rare. And I want to emphasize this a lot because there are much few, uh, less research, much fewer re, uh, clinic, clinicians focusing on patients who have right neglect. And these patients, they are in need for services. And I advocate like strongly, you should screen all stroke patients, all brain damage patients for spatial neglect, no matter their primary brain damage is on the right side or left side. This data, is based on the, our systematic review. And we also have firsthand data I can share with you. So Kimberly Rayhart is a dear colleague of me, of mine. Uh, we have worked together for more than 10 years. And we just recently completed a huge project we call the implementation project. We work with 16 different rehabilitation hospitals across the United States. We trained all the OTs in these hospitals how to assess, how to treat spatial neglect. So the data were uh, gathered from all these participating rehab hospitals for more than four years. The total end is pretty large. It's more than 4,000 patient data points in the data, in the data set. And in this sample, more than 50% of patients, they can have, uh, so all the OTs that we work with, they serve patients who have neurological disorders. So this can be stroke or traumatic brain injury patients or non-traumatic brain injury. And the total in this total sample, about 80% of them are stroke patients. Anyway, so what I want to show is spatial neglect is very prevalent in rehab hospital settings. More than half of them have spatial neglect. And again, consistent to what I just showed you, more, more patients have left-sided neglect and less have right-sided neglect, but 35% is not, it's not rare. It's quite common as well. So I hope I convinced you there is a high prevalence of spatial neglect after stroke and also after TBI. I, did a, I don't have time to go into TBI research. If you're interested, you can look at this. I published something on TBI as well. So it's also quite, high prevalence after TBI. Spatial neglect impedes rehabilitation progress. Um, patients who have spatial neglect, they recover much slower or they have difficulty to hit the uh, milestone for rehabilitation outcome than patients who do not have spatial neglect. And increased risk of in-hospital falls and injury. It doesn't matter whether a patient have mild or severe neglect in this case. Once they can physically strong enough to walk around because they are not paying attention to their environment as fully completely as other patients, they are easily to fall uh, and have injuries. And predict spatial neglect predicts 
poor prognosis in self-care, mobility, community reintegration, once they are discharged back home, intensifies family caregivers' burden. So all these are the impacts. Now I'm going to move on assessments. First types of assessments called neuropsychological assessments or non-ecological assessment. And these are examples I have shown you uh, many um, for a couple of slides, you know, figure copying drawing, target cancellation, or clock drawing can show you whether a patient have neglected signs or symptoms. This I haven't shown you, it's, it's line back section. It's very easy, it's just a horizontal line, you print it on a piece of paper or you present it on a computer screen and you ask patient to mark the center, to cut the line in half, basically. And this is an example of patients who have uh, right brain damage and neglecting the left side. This is the behavior. And here is another uh, test we called uh, NIH stroke scale. There are 11 items on the NIH stroke scale. The last item is extinction. It's related to spatial neglect. It's something that I, I in the previous slides, I said I'm going to tell you more about. Um, so it is not paper pencil test. It's a, it's a so-called uh, confrontational examination from clinician's perspective. You just, and you can do this in different modalities, for example, in the visual modality, tactile modality, and auditory modality. And these are the three modalities that I use in my own research context. So what you do is to you present visual modality, for example, you wave both of your hands right in front of the patient, you just you know, sit in the in, uh, um, comfortable conversation distance, and you wave one hand, the other hand, and both hands. So for patients who have um, left and neglect, for example, when you show this in their right side, they will say, oh, this hand is waving. When you show this hand, even if it's in their so-called neglected side, they will still point to it because they are in this confined uh, environment, control environment. They are paying attention to the moment. They will pay attention to this hand. But when you wave both hands, they will say only, only one hand is moving and they will indicate the hand on their right side. This is called extinction. And you can do this in tactile modality and auditory modality as well. All right. So all these neuropsychological, non-ecological tests, they are very sensitive. There are so many studies um, um, supporting their sensitivity, specificity, you know, all these. There's one weakness of these um, tests is that they are not directly translatable to to daily life functions, to clinical, to clinicians, right? So when you see patients only draw half a clock, you don't know whether a patient sit up straight. You don't know whether a patient can dress themselves, you know, properly on both sides. You don't know whether patients have difficulty to look for things in their rooms. So there has been a push to develop ecological or functional assessment for spatial neglect. And here is the most commonly used scale. It's called Catherine Bagagel scale. It's named after Dr. Catherine Bagagel. Um, she passed away the year before the scale was published. That's why uh, their team named the scale after her. So the scale is include 10 questions. It's a questionnaire style scale presented to clinicians. So cl clinicians will work with their patients and then they use the scale and then they ask themselves whether the patient, you know, can do all these things, right? So, and then for each item, the patient, uh, the clinician will rate the patient from zero to three, no neglect, mild neglect, moderate neglect, or severe neglect. As you can see, all these wordings are focusing on the left neglect. For example, exhibits difficulty in looking towards the left. Right. So this scale is focusing on left neglect. It was published in English in 1996, and we, uh, in 2008, uh, we started, my team want to use this, and we find great difficulties because we want to um, assess patients who have right neglect as well. And also it is unclear to us what is the definition of mild, moderate, or severe neglect for each single items. In order to make this scale easier and standardize it for better use, for broader use, we created Kessler Foundation Neglect Assessment Process or KFNAP. We are not replacing CBS, we are standardizing how to use it. 
So this is the first publication in 2012. And recently, this year, 10 years later, we have a more publication talking about this, uh, how to use KFNAP as well. And you can download it, it's free uh, online, you can just use it. And you can see that what we did uh, superficially, at least uh, we changed the questionnaire format into a chart. And now you can, you can um, assess patients who have left-sided neglect or right-sided neglect. And as you can see, all these are very different from neuropsychological or paper pencil test, right? We look at patients' grooming behavior, navigation behavior, how they eat a, a meal. So go back to this um, prevalence uh, data. And we can use this data to try to answer the question, what kind of assessment should you use, right? So in the same study, we separate the data in terms of assessment type and the diagnostic criteria. So here, just to orient you how to read this chart, you will see three um, more data points in terms of studies that using ecological assessment or study using non-ecological assessment to define whether a patient who has spatial neglect or not. As you can see, for studies that use ecological assessment, such as Catherine scale, um, they find more patients to have spatial neglect than studies who use traditional non-ecological assessment. The reason being that most non-ecological tests are only in one space, only in the so-called peripersonal within arm reach space, and mostly focusing on the visual domain, right? But ecological functional assessment, it's in daily life. Uh, there are so many different things happening in daily life, and so it's more sensitive to capture the different different symptoms and uh, the complexity of spatial neglect. Another way to think about how you use assessment is what kind of criteria you should use. So a lot of study using so-called single cutoff criteria, like the CBS, zero is the cutoff. Zero means no neglect. For patients who score more than zero have spatial neglect, right? And the multi-test method means that uh, we use multiple tests. We use that say six tests. We can use line bisection, star cancellation, clock drawing, uh, different things. And then we can define if patients fail certain number of all the tests, they are diagnosed with spatial neglect. And this multi-test method has been become more and more popular in research um, community. So as you can see, for studies using this multi-test method, they um, detect a slightly more patient who has spatial neglect than studies that use single cutoff criteria. So based on these findings and my, and my own experience, I suggest that you should use one ecological test. If you know more, if you, if you like CBS, you, if you like KFNAP, you can use that, plus at least three very different non-ecological tests, such as extinction, target cancellation and figure copying. I have been making these suggestions for five years now, since, or at least three years since this study was published online back in 2019. Um, but, and I just found that my suggestion is very consistent to uh, with this, the recent uh, European Academy of Neurology recommendation they make. It's also like pick three very different um, non-ecological test plus a ecological or functional assessment to, to screen and assess patients. All right, so before I move on to treatment related to assessment and clinical care, I want to give you some take home message. First, the first step, the first ever step is so important for spatial neglect care is screen all patients with brain injuries for spatial neglect. If you don't do this first step, you never know whether a patient has spatial neglect. You may overlook patients who have mild form of spatial neglect, okay? You need to identify them first because like I said, most of them, they do not know they have spatial neglect. They do not know the, the consequences of their deficits. So they cannot advocate for themselves. So you have to do that for them. And when you do it, if you have the resources, 
uh, I suggested that you assess and observe patients using different tests or under different real life situations. This will provide you a comprehensive idea of the patient's presentation of spatial neglect. Here, I just want to emphasize again, spatial neglect is a syndrome caused by impaired neural networks, critical for spatial processing and attention control. Because of that, spatial neglect affects multiple perceptual, cognitive, and motor functions, not just perceptual. All right, so um, because I told you, just hold your questions and I will answer all your questions at the end after my lecture. I'm going to move on to the treatment. And also, if you have, you can, um, this is a website that I created in 2011 and keep updating um, to provide information to not just researchers, but to clinicians, to patients and their families to help them learn more about spatial neglect. All right, I think I'm right on time. I'm moving on to treatment. Um, this chart is copy and paste from um, an article uh, from uh, American Heart Association, Amer American Stroke Association guideline. This is their latest guideline, which is published in 2016, uh, talking about all stroke rehabilitation care. One thing, of course, they include a spatial neglect because it is very uh, common after stroke. As I just mentioned to you, I show you the stats. And they recommend the seven different treatment options. Prism adaptation, visual scanning training, optokinetic stimulation, virtual reality, limb activation, mental imagery, neck vibration and all. So I just want to say that the guideline is published in 2016. That means they reviewed the study up to about 2012 before they you know, write it up and publish it. So I would say the recommendation may be a little bit outdated. There are more, there are new informations out there. However, even in the new so-called new information is still within this realm of these options and all these treatments are being refined and, re and um, advanced because of new technology and new research data. So I'm going to quickly go through them and skip some of them. Um, and the reason is I'm going to talk about prism adaptation uh, and what is the visual scanning training? So the promise, um, the, the premise or the condition to provide patient visual scanning training is the patient have to be able to learn strategies. You work with this person, you know this person have the ability to learn strategies or not. And you think this patient may have the ability to do so, you can teach them to do visual search and scanning to start with the anchor on the neglected side. Anchor, so for example, um, you can put a bright, like a red or a yellow stripe at the, the left end, uh, if patient have left neglect, the left end of the table, put it there and ask patient to find that anchor line first and scan back from the neglected side to the good side. Optokinetic stimulation is an eye movement exercise. It's an exercise turning eyeballs from the good side to the neglected side. And how do you do that? You can literally just bring a pen and ask patient to follow the pen from the good side to the neglected side. As you can see, this exercise has nothing to do with learning strategy. It's, it's an exercise. So the patient, you know, it's a very minimal cognitive demand and they can just do this. And uh, researchers, of course, they created um, automatic presentation to ask patients to follow dots on the computer screen, for example, from the good side to the neglected side. And you have to do this um, probably up to a thousand times within a session to make it work. So this is quite labor intensive. I'm going to skip quickly about virtual reality and move on to limb activation. Limb activation is based on the theory that um, because after stroke, for example, after right brain stroke, patients usually have difficulty to move the left side of their body, either their most of because you know, limb is very important for our daily function. So patients have difficulty to move their left arm, for example, to move their left finger because 
the motor networks on the uh, uh, damaged brain was, you know, is broken, and the motor network and the attention network are highly connected. So if you encourage patients to move the affected arm, even, even though they cannot even lift it, they can probably just squeeze it, you know, do a shoulder shrug, you encourage them to do that because the, the more they do so, it will activate more on the damaged side of the brain. So that's why this technique is called limb activation. So if patient is able to move the affected arm in any way, even just slight, slight uh, movement, uh, encourage them to use it to perform reaching tasks toward the neglected side. I'm going to skip mental image imagery as well uh, because the, the protocol is not very standardized. And the neck vibration is to focus on the vestibular system because vestibular information is one kind of sensory information that's critical for spatial processing, for attention allocation. So neck vibration is literally it's massage the back of the neck because the back of the neck is very close to vestibular system. You can use a um, you know uh, electronic massager to put on the back of the um, of the of the neck of the patient while they're doing other things. Like in this example, they uh, they suggest using it with prism adaptation. So this neck vibration is you have to do it. It's a treatment while the patient is doing the task. The others are standalone treatments. You know, they, they, you can uh, measure outcome after treatment is complete. So I skipped vi uh, vi um, virtual reality, but not really skipping. I myself are studying virtual reality as a method, how to create effective treatments. And this treatment, I call it uh, KFSRT, um, has been developed since 2017. And uh, um, now we are using MetaQuest. It's a standalone device. There's no wire, so we can bring this to patients home. So I'm running a home-based clinical trial right now using this and then having patients to go through different treatment modules. And the treatment modules are based on what we understand about spatial neglect, what we understand about all the treatments that I just showed you. You can create it, recreate it, or uh, enhance it in a so-called uh, virtual reality technology environment. All right. Now I'm going to focus on prism adaptation. I'm going to show you a video. Okay. Easy to detect. A loved one can't speak. Perhaps they can't move. But there's another sign of a stroke that many of us can't see. It's called spatial neglect, and it can occur during or after a stroke, causing distorted visual movements. Fortunately, there's a solution by using optical prism technology during rehabilitation. If you or a loved one have experienced a stroke, ask your doctor about spatial neglect. Spatial neglect. See the whole picture at KesslerFoundation.org. All right, that was a, a 30 second um, public service announcement we created um, about seven years ago now, and it's still very valid uh, nowadays. A stroke can be. Um, so let me talk about what is prism adaptation. Prism adaptation itself is not a treatment, it is a known visual motor phenomenon, right? We, we know it since back in 1960s. If you're interested, I can uh, share this paper with you. It's published in Science. Um, so it has been documented uh, in detail how this phenomenon come to be, you know, how we observe it. And we even know the neural circuits toward um, underlying this phenomenon. So anyone whose cortical cerebellar circuits are intact should demonstrate this phenomenon. You cannot, um, fight it, basically. I've been teaching prism adaptation, teaching prism adaptation treatment, clinicians talk about it for more than a decade. I still show this phenomenon. Okay, so what it is. So before putting on the prism glasses, for example, you can easily reach to any target, you know, in your, in your visual field. Your vision guide your motor movement, your arm movement. You can reach to the target, no problem. Now I'm putting the prism glasses on you. 
So this prism glasses is, is shifting visual image. This is the actual visual image. But if you when you look through the prism glasses, you can see the images shift toward the right side. So in this cartoon, this is the actual target, the physical location, but this is the image you see. So at the beginning, when the left based prism is put on, left base meaning the left side of the glasses is thicker and then it shift image toward the right side. This is image toward the right side. And intuitively, your arms will reach to the visual image, right? You, you, your system think, oh, that's where the target is. So you miss the target. After several practice, your motor system register, oh, now I shouldn't trust the visual image telling me where the target is. I should move my hand a little bit to the left so that I can touch the real target. So that is why it's called adaptation. The key is not the prism. The key is the adaptation. Adaptation is a visual motor process. So after a couple of practice, I would say after 10 or even 20 reach movements in patients, for healthy people, really after 10, probably 10 practice, we can all reach to the target, no problem, perfectly. Okay, and then after prism adaptation occurs, we remove the prism glasses, right? Once we remove it, but the motor system still in this adaptation mode, still think, oh, I should move a little bit left in order to touch the target. And this is when an error occur, we call the after effect, after prism removal, that the arm will shift toward the left side of the target, this leftward movement. And this is very important because patients who have left neglect, they have difficulty to initiate movement toward the left. Now, after this, they just move it to the left of objects, of everything. In healthy people, prism after effect disappears literally within five to 30 minutes. No, definitely no more than 30 minutes. And you can you go back to normal, right? It's like it's like when you put on new prescribed eyeglasses, you need some time to get used to it. And the getting used to it is so-called adaptation. For patients, this after effect lasts much longer, mainly due to their brain damage. And so that means we're using this after effect and prolonged after effect to make it into a treatment effect. So the groundbreaking study published in 1998 in Nature from a group of scientists in France, they use prism adaptation as treatments for patients who have spatial neglect. So this is a small randomized control trial, patients who are in the prism adaptation group or control group. So before the prism adaptation, um, they, as you can see, these are two representative uh, drawings of two different patients. Before the treatment, um, they all copy things on the right side, only neglecting the left side. After the treatment, immediately after the prism glasses is, is removed, taken off, um, patient in the treatment condition draw more um, stimuli on the, on the left side, patient in the control stay the same. And then late, meaning two hours later, this person draw even more, pay more attention to the left side. And the control group didn't change. This is individual patient performance. This is a group level analysis. As you can see, in the PRISM group, they just continue to improve even after two hours. So after this 1998 study, a lot of researchers around the world, including our group, um, start to you know, put our effort into studying why this happened. How can we help patients with prism ad adaptation treatment? So here I'm just going to show you a systematic review results. This group from Canada, um, they published this study. They look at the literature, look at the studies using so-called functional assessment as outcome measures for um, prism adaptation, either um, they like reading and writing is a functional task, ADL, activity of daily living direct test or ADL questionnaires. Do we ask patient directly self-report or navigation tasks? And here's a number of uh, studies that show significant effect or no significant effect. As you can see, in general, 
or overall, you may say there's mixed results, but there are more significant effect studies than non-significant effect studies. So I want to say is prism adaptation or any kind of treatment for spatial neglect, it's not um, perfect for individual patients. There are huge individual differences because in the previous, in the earlier part of the lecture, I show you symptoms of neglect are very diverse and there's huge um, individual differences due to their brain damage, due to you know which part of the brain was damaged, which part of the network is uh, dysfunctional. So the current theory, how prism adaptation works is complex. So it is a optic device using prism lenses, but the treatment effect happened deep in the brain, not at the eye level, but in the brain level. So for example, the cerebellum is highly involved. When you first put on the prism glasses, you need some kind of recalibration. The motor system and the visual system need to realign and you have this immediate awareness of, oh, I didn't touch the target. What should I do next so that I can touch the target? And once the system get aligned, there are more implicit realignment process happening the, the, um, involving even the motor cortex. And later, these all circuits are uh, consolidated after multiple sessions, not just one session of prism adaptation, after multiple sessions, the effect goes into other uh, cort cortical areas that's important for other cognitive functions and it goes to even frontal lobe to the temporal lobe. Here is another schema that um, my team and I uh, created to showcase you know, the potential differences within healthy brain and the patient who have right brain damage. Why, how, how did it, um, it's a theoretical account, how PRISM um, shifted visual information affect our brain. And our hypothesis is that in patients who have a right brain damage, for example, their um, posterior parietal cortex somehow is damaged or the function of it is damaged, even if it's intact. Um, um, then patient need to find implicitly, now you know, they're not consciously aware, but their brain system had to find a way to bypass um, posterior par parietal cortex in order for prism, prism adaptation phenomena to uh, show the effect at a brain level. And we are currently studying all these theories to test them. You may not be able to understand deeply how this works, but I want to emphasize again, it, prism adaptation, the prism lens, actually I have the goggles with me. Um, it's an optical device with prism lenses, but it works at the brain level, not at the eye level. So it is not a visual treatment. It is a visual motor adaptation training at the brain level. So it is a neural rehabilitation treatment approach. If you're interested more uh, on this topic, we have published many studies on prism adaptation. You're well, welcome to take a look at them. So moving on to clinical implementation, because we have studied it for a long time and then we create a tool um, for the necessity of move things around easily, we created a portable kit. We call it Kessler Foundation Prism Adaptation Treatment or KF PAT. You do not have to, like I said, I'm not, I'm not a businesswoman trying to sell you things. You do not have to use this treatment kit to deliver prism adaptation treatment. There are different ways. Um, and But if you want to, you can go to this website and order the kit. So the advantage of this whole kit is, so prism lenses are very important, the key, but there are other devices, elements within the treatment that is necessary to facilitate this treatment uh, for uh, clinicians to, to guide the patient, go through the treatment process. So this, that is why uh, other than prism lenses, there are other things that's included in the treatment kit. And you can put everything into a bag and you can carry it around to patients' rooms, even to patients' homes. So right now, uh, we in this treatment protocol, we say um, you have to provide one session a day at least. 
each session including 60 visual motor on movement with prism goggles on or up to 20 minutes. So this phrase up to 20 minutes is for the purpose to fitting prism adapt adaptation treatment into an OT session within United States. Because in United States, OT session only lasts 45 minutes. The 45 minutes, including set up the device to bring patient from one station to another station to address all different kinds of things, right? So 45 minutes is very short in order to help OT to, to put prism adaptation into uh, their session. We say, okay, if patients cannot do 60 R movement, then just do it at least 20 minutes. However, this is not a circumstances that um, limit you in your own practice. So I would say you can do more. So the recommendation now is 10 days over two weeks. That means 10 sessions over 14 days. Okay, so now I'm going to show you another study um, related to this treatment because as I said, uh, because of necessity, because of the limitation in the United States. This regimen, 10 days over two weeks, for OTs in the United States, it's difficult. They, it's not easy to complete this because the average length of stay for stroke patients is 17 days. Um, 17 days, if patients are very severe, have very, very severe medical conditions, you know, within the first couple of days, you cannot really do any treatment with them. They're not engaging in treatment activities. Now you have last days, you have to, also you have to uh, take weekends into account, patients do not receive a weekend treatment sometimes. So it is very difficult for OTs to implement this in their practice. So while we are teaching all the OTs doing um, KF NAP assessment and KF PAD the treatment, we also ask them to submit their data to us so we can um, anal to analyze data and provide them more uh, recommendations based on this um, clinical information they provided us. So the question is, does number of PAT sessions have impact on spatial neglect improvement and rehabilitation outcomes? So through that big data set, we look at patients whose CBS via KF NAP is greater than zero, meaning they have spatial neglect, and we exclude patients who are uh, outliers that they stay in the hospital for whatever reason that's much longer than um, average patients. And after this inclusion exclusion, we included uh, 2,491 patients in the analysis. And consistently, there are more patients who have left neglect than right neglect. So I'm not going to go into detail how we did analysis, but this is the outcome, this is the result of the study, the summary. So what we found is receiving more once daily prism adaptation treatment sessions predict greater improvement in spatial neglect. So if they cannot do 10, how about do five, do six to seven sessions that will improve their outcome. And for patients who receive prism adaptation at a higher uh, at a higher frequency, meaning fewer days between two consecutive sessions for eight or more sessions predict better improvement. So more the better and the higher frequency, the better. So in general, receiving more once daily prism adaptation treatment sessions predict greater rehabilitation outcome. So this is our contribution to the field about the dosage uh, debate because it is very difficult for behavioral treatment studies to come up with, oh, what is the, the, the good intensity of the treatment? And even though this is not a prospective randomized control trial, this is the retrospective um, chart review data analysis. It tells us this very important uh, information and I want to share with you. Okay, as I said, you don't have um, length of stay problem as we do in the United States. So my suggestions for you is that provide prism adaptation at least once a day for 10 days for over two weeks. And why is that? Why two weeks? Because that's what most researchers have the resources for. Um, you can do more than two weeks. You can do more than 10 days, but this is the minimum I suggest that you should do. 
Within each session, have patients perform as many visually guided arm reaching movement as possible. So in other words, how long the patient wear the prism goggles does not matter. Okay, if the patient just wear the prism goggles and watching TV, that will not work because the key, like I said, it's not the prism glasses. The key is the adaptation. The key is the visual motor adaptation process. So you want the patient to perform as many visually guided arm reaching movements as possible. Um, so in our protocol, we ask patient to use a pen, right, to cross a circle, right, or you can ask the patient to reach something. For OTs, I know you, you're going to ask, you can ask patients to do some so-called functional daily life activities. So for example, pick up their phone, um, pick up a pen to reach something. So as long as it's arm reach movement toward a visible target while wearing the prism glasses, that is fine. Okay, do as much as that. It doesn't matter the number. So what it matters is the number of visually guided arm reach movement because the, the more they practice within the goggle, um, the arm reach movement that will strengthen their adaptation in the brain. And after the session is over, you take off the glasses, then their after effect will be stronger and last longer. And that is the base, that's the foundation of prism adaptation treatment. All right. So, and I think you may ask, you know, when I talk about intensity, you may ask, what are, are the prescription of the prism lenses? There's no prescription. This is not something we give to the patient so they wear all the time. No, they only wear this when they are in a session with the therapist. So the same prism goggle fit for all neglect treatment, for all neglect patients. So you can have one treatment kit to treat um, 10, 20, 30 patients that you're, care, you're, you're providing care for in your unit. So this is not a prescribed, this is not a tailored, this is a device to facilitate prism adaptation process, the, um, the visual motor phenomena. Okay, and I also highly recommend that you assess outcome after 10 days, even if you're doing the treatment more than 10 days, at least every 10 days or every week, you assess their outcome so that they know, so that you know, you, you know that they are improving and you have a measurable outcome to quantify the improvement. Um, if spatial neglect improves, but the improvement is not satisfactory, you can do another round or you can combine with other treatments in your practice. Okay. So, and I'm come to come to the end of my um, my talk, my lecture, and then I'll, I'll receive uh, your questions. So first of all, the take home message, even though I've talked about prison adaptation a lot during this lecture, but spatial neglect can be treated in different ways. Prison adaptation is just one of many different ways. It is a visual motor training the prism adaptation treatment using an optic device. The treatment does not improve visual function. It does not improve the eye level function, but in, improves functional vision because it actually works on the attention network, improves the functional vision and also um, other um, um, functions or impairment affected by spatial neglect. So it's not just um, cre creating improvement in the visual domain. So, and uh, uh, you can integrate in the treatment, the prison adaptation treatment in clinical practice, because now I have evidence, I have experience that it can be done in rehabilitation hospitals in the United States, and you can definitely do it in your facility. And it is feasible, and we recommend it. And that's it for my lecture. I'm right on time. So um, I see many questions on the chat box because I cannot read Spanish. So I will need uh, the translator's help to go through them. And however you would like to do so, let me know. <laughs> 